With an estimated 100,000 flights taking off and landing each day, air travel is one of the most safe and reliable methods of transportation. To keep us safe, airlines have some closely guarded secrets that are not known to passengers. From secret compartments to covert codes and signals, here are 15 amazing flight secrets that people don't know about. Starting with number 15, emergency landings are quite common. Probably the last thing you'd ever want to hear when you're traveling in an aircraft is that the pilot needs to perform an emergency landing. And while it's true that flying is one of the safest modes of transport, there are far more emergency landings than you might think. Of course, events like these are not normally thought of as being needed when there's something seriously wrong with the aircraft, but priority clearance is given to planes landing at airports for a number of different reasons. A study that looked at a five-month period in the U.S., for example, found that there had been 50 emergency landings at Newark Airport and 34 at LaGuardia in the same time, with at least one happening per day on average in the New York area alone. These figures are by no means unusual and are similar to those seen in most other major airports around the world, but aren't cause for a concern or a sign of any industry cover-up. In fact, the number one reason for emergency landings is that a passenger has fallen ill on board and needs quick access to medical assistance on the ground. And other reasons are usually to do with faults that develop on the plane that, because of the way they're designed, have no impact on safety, but it's still preferable to have them land as quickly as possible so it can be looked into. These can include engine failures, loss of pressure in the cabins, fires, unexplained smoke, or a loss of hydraulics. And in the vast majority of times, they don't cause any issues to the passengers on board, which is why they aren't widely reported. Number 14. How close are other planes? While aircraft are huge vehicles that often carry hundreds of people or huge amounts of cargo, and it's a huge organizational effort to make sure they can move around on the ground at an airport with enough space for each one. You'd expect things to be different once they're airborne, though. After all, the sky is such a vast place that it would seem there's very little need for planes to get very close to each other. But the reality is, is that they fly far nearer to other planes in certain circumstances than most people think. Because of the amount of air traffic, with an estimated 10 to 15,000 commercial airliners in the sky around the world at any one time, authorities have designated airways that planes have to follow, which act as highways in the sky. Found at various altitudes, these make sure planes are flying in similar directions and allow for them to be bunched up closer, particularly when approaching or leaving a busy airport. The official rule is that when flying below 29,000 feet, there only needs to be a 1,000 foot or 3,000 meter vertical separation, and as little as 3 nautical miles in horizontal separation, with these distances sometimes being extended at higher altitudes or in more remote regions. This may seem like a big distance at first, once you take into consideration that the largest commercial aircraft, the Airbus A380, is almost 239 feet or 73 meters long and 262 feet or 80 meters wide, it's got a cruising speed of 561 miles an hour, and you realize that no matter how little you see out of your window, you aren't quite as alone up there as it may look. Number 13. The Oxygen Masks with the number of flights that take place each day, the chances of being involved in any type of incident are vanishingly rare. But just so you're prepared for such a scenario, a safety briefing is always played before a departure. One of the more recognizable elements of this is the part where the oxygen masks deploy from hatches in the ceiling. And these are often seen as some of the most important pieces of safety equipment on an aircraft. But how much do you really know about how they work? And how reliable are they? Deploying when there's a loss of cabin pressure, which can happen for a range of different reasons. They are vital because the air at altitudes above 10,000 feet has too little oxygen for you to be able to breathe. In theory, from a complete loss of pressure at that height, you'd have around 18 seconds to fit your mask before you begin to feel the effects of hypoxia. Most people assume that the masks are connected to a dedicated oxygen cylinder, but these would add a huge amount of weight to a plane and pose a potential fire hazard as well. So aircraft use a completely different method to provide oxygen in an emergency. Instead, chemicals are reacted together, which produce oxygen as a result, and this is what you'll breathe in. This process also means you're likely to smell burning as the mask deploys and the chemical reaction begins, but this isn't a problem and is instead a sign that things are working as intended. Importantly though, the masks only have enough supply to provide oxygen for between 10 and 20 minutes after they've been activated, with the idea being that this is plenty of time for the pilot to descend below 10,000 feet, where you'll be able to breathe the air in the cabin. Number 12. The Chimes 
So there's a lot going on inside the cabin of a commercial airliner, especially with each passenger needing different things and limited crew to take care of everyone. Think back to the last time you were on a flight, and you'll most likely remember hearing chimes occasionally sounding out. And rather than that being part of the aircraft operating, these are a quick way for the crew working on the plane to send messages to each other without the passengers knowing what's happening. And this is particularly important on long flights where there can be as many as 30 crew working and smart communication is vital. If you're on an Airbus aircraft, for example, you'll hear a boing sound shortly after takeoff, and this is to let the crew know that at the moment your landing gear is being retracted, which is also something you may feel depending on where you're sitting. The second bong you'll hear usually happens when the seatbelt sign are being turned off, and then from there you'll begin to hear chimes. If there's a single chime, this is normally a signal that a passenger has pressed their call bell, and it's to let the crew know that someone has asked for assistance, and who to look out for if it was. A high-low chime, on the other hand, is usually the ringtone of a crew phone when one galley or section is calling another, and will most commonly happen when food is being given out, where the crew are asking each other if there's spare food or snacks. The other call that happens on most flights is a triple low-low chime. This is a message from the flight deck that there may be turbulence ahead. If you hear this, then you'll probably see the crew putting up the meal carts and loose objects away, and preparing for the seatbelt sign to be switched on. Number 11. Bathroom Ashtrays In the early days of passenger flights, smoking was not permitted on most aircraft, but in the US, at least, it's been prohibited on commercial flights by the FAA since 1990, with many other countries following suit soon after. It may come as a surprise, then, that after more than 30 years, you're still seeing no smoking signs next to the seatbelt sign, and even find ashtrays in the toilets. But there's a simple reason for that. It's a feature that's on new planes, too, so it isn't just left over on an aircraft that may have been flying for decades, and it's all for safety. It's all because authorities believe that no matter how many times people are told that smoking is prohibited, there's always a risk that someone will try and have a sneaky cigarette. The no smoking signs are there as a constant reminder, but still, in modern times, passengers often lock themselves in the bathroom for a smoke where they think they'll get away with it. This couldn't be further from the truth, of course, because the cabins of aircraft have extremely sensitive smoke detectors, and the moment you light up in the bathroom, an alarm will sound for the cabin crew. They do have the ability to open up the door from the outside, but most will likely bang on the door at first. In that moment of panic, the smoker will look for the best place to put out their SIG, and everyone on board will be much safer if they're able to stub it out in an ashtray than trying to quickly dispose of it anywhere else, particularly as there's likely to be a lot of paper in any bathroom bin. Number 10. Cabin Darkness is a Safety Feature no matter which cabin you're traveling in, flying is an unavoidably cramped and uncomfortable experience, particularly if it's for a long-distance journey, and airlines and their crew will do everything within reason to make it as pleasant as possible. The main priority, though, is safety, and this means that there are some things that have to be done that may not be so convenient, but ensure that everyone is prepared just in case an emergency happens. One of these is that during takeoff and landing at nighttime, most of the lights in the cabin will be switched off. While this may seem like it's an attempt to reduce light pollution around airports, it's actually an important safety feature, which is all the more important during the trickiest parts of a flight. If there's a problem, having perfect visibility can make all the difference, so the lights are turned off to give your eyes a chance to adapt to the natural light levels, and having a window shades open helps you keep you oriented with your surroundings. It actually takes between 10 minutes and a half hour for the human eye to fully adjust to dark conditions, and the lower light levels in the cabin give everyone plenty of times to do this. It also means that if the emergency light and illuminated pathways need to be used, they'll be much more visible too, and everyone will be ready to follow evacuation procedures when they're told to do so. Another benefit of lower light levels beyond that of safety is that it significantly reduces the power usage on the aircraft, and during the critical stages of a flight, engine performance is optimized to give the pilots the power they need to ensure a smooth takeoff or landing. Number 9. Boarding from the left have you noticed every time you board an aircraft, you do so from the left side? Far from being a coincidence, this is very much a part of the design. The tradition of boarding from the left actually dates back to the early days of aviation, when initially aircraft were designed with the pilot sitting on the left side, similar to the maritime tradition where the captain would navigate from the left or port side. This design choice was carried forward into larger aircraft, and as a result, boarding and deplaning typically occur to the left side to avoid disturbing the pilot's workspace. 
Boarding from the left side also makes practical sense too, in terms of airport design and efficiency. Most airports are laid out with the assumption that planes will board from the left, and this allows for a more streamlined process, as jet bridges and airport services such as catering and cleaning are positioned in line with this convention. The right side of the aircraft, typically called the starboard side, is often reserved for these servicing activities and refueling. This separation of boarding passengers and servicing activities reduces congestion and increases efficiency of both processes. Furthermore, by standardizing the boarding process, crew members and ground staff can operate under a familiar and consistent system, which minimizes the risk of errors or accidents. Additionally, having a single standard boarding procedure simplifies training and emergency evacuation, and overall improves the passenger experience as well. It allows you to enter the aircraft and find your seats without navigating through busy service activities happening on the other side, making the boarding process smoother and less chaotic. Since this has become commonplace, aircraft are designed with it in mind too, and this is an important structural implication. The larger plug doors that you enter and exit through have to be reinforced to not create a weakness in the airplane's fuselage, and it's better to avoid having this on both sides of a plane if possible. The placement of all doors, galleys, lavatories, and seating is configured to support the convention, and any attempt at changing it would be a significant redesign of aircraft and airport infrastructure, which is neither practical nor cost-effective. Number 8. The Crew Rest If you've ever been on a long-haul flight and noticed that partway through there appears to be an entirely new cabin crew, then you've stumbled across one of the operational secrets of commercial air travel. Flights lasting a long time can be too long for an individual to keep alert and be able to perform well in an emergency, so there may actually be two shifts, with those not on duty able to sleep or relax in the crew rest. The crew rest area is usually strategically located away from passengers to provide a quiet and private environment. For pilots, it's often directly above the cockpit or in the front section of the aircraft, accessible via a ladder or hidden staircase. Cabin crew rests are typically located either on the upper deck of larger aircraft like the Boeing 777 or Airbus A380 or at the rear end. These areas are designed to be compact yet comfortable, maximizing space while providing a good environment for rest. The compartments are equipped with features that ensure comfort during rest periods that many passengers would love for themselves, such as flatbeds, privacy curtains, personal reading lights, and sometimes individual entertainment systems. The bedding is comfortable, and the area is temperature controlled, ensuring a restful environment. For pilots, the rest area might also include a communication system to allow for quick contact with the cockpit if needed. The provision of crew rest areas is not just a matter of comfort, but also a regulatory requirement for long-haul flights. Aviation authorities like the Federal Aviation Administration and the European Union Aviation Safety Agency have strict guidelines on crew rest. These regulations dictate the minimum rest periods, the quality of rest facilities, and when the crew members should take their breaks, especially on flights exceeding a certain number of hours. The main reason, of course, is for safety, with pilot fatigue being a real concern. By providing accommodation like this, airlines can ensure that they can operate long-distance flights while remaining completely safe. And from the passenger point of view, you'd rarely even know this was happening. Moving on to number seven, don't walk under the wing. When you're boarding a plane, you'll walk through a bridge from the gate, but there are still times when you may need to walk across the airport tarmac and are given very specific route that you must take. Most importantly, you'll never be allowed to walk beneath the wings of an aircraft, and this just isn't a rule for passengers, but for most airport workers too, and there's a very good reason for it. The main concern, of course, is safety. Airplane wings are often equipped with various protruding parts such as flaps, ailerons, and sometimes sharp edges. And these parts can pose a physical hazard to individuals walking underneath, especially in low visibility conditions or when the wings are moving. The wing's underside is not typically designed for pedestrian safety and lacks the clearances and warnings that are standard in pedestrian areas. The area under the wings, especially near the fuel tanks, is also a high-risk zone for fire or explosion. Fuel vents are often located under the wings, and any spillage or vapor accumulation in this area can be extremely dangerous. The presence of people under the wings increases the risk for accidental ignition, particularly if they're carrying electronic devices or other potential sources of ignition. There's also the possibility that walking under the wings could interfere with airport operations as ground crew and maintenance personnel need clear access to the area around the aircraft for refueling, baggage handling, inspections, and other essential tasks. 
Unauthorized persons walking under wings can disrupt these operations, leading to delays and operational inefficiencies, and potentially even lead to errors or accidents. In modern times, too, the space under the wings is often designated as a restricted area for security reasons. Unauthorized access to these areas can be seen as a security threat, potentially leading to security breaches, and airports are required to maintain strict controls over who can access these areas. Walking under the wings without proper authorization or supervision can therefore lead to legal consequences. Airports have strict rules and regulations regarding access to aircraft and operational areas, and violating these rules can result in fines, legal action, or being banned from the airport premises altogether. Number 6. Pilotless Flights On the ground, we seem to be getting ever closer to the reality of driverless cars taking us from place to place. And while it may seem like the technology for completely pilotless flights is further away, it's actually already possible. In 2019, for example, Airbus conducted a series of flights whereby a test aircraft with two pilots on board successfully took off, flew, and then landed under the autopilot with no pilot input at all, and it all went seamlessly. The company has since expanded this test program and shown that for normal flight operations at least, the technology is more than capable of handling things. It's done with a normal autopilot combined with a series of cameras and sensors that help it adjust its position on the runway, and future tests will show whether these two can be used for taxiing maneuvers in airports as well. There are, of course, a number of regulatory hurdles to overcome before this is allowed with passengers on board, and the question of how an autopilot would react to a mid-air emergency compared to how a pilot would react. But the truth is, most practices are already done automatically with the pilots overseeing what's happening and being able to take control if they need to. A survey of 22,000 people in 2019 even suggests that as many as 70% of passengers would be happy to fly in an automatically controlled plane, with many thinking it may be even safer than one that was being controlled by a pilot. It could well be a long way off until pilots no longer board a plane with us, but with tests being more common, you may well find that your next flight is completely controlled by an AI, and the pilot is there just in case things don't perform quite as expected. Number 5. Turbulence is becoming more common thanks to climate change So climate change is increasingly affecting the world that we live in, and flights are no exception. Regardless of your view on exactly what's responsible for causing global warming, it's undeniable that it is actually happening, with consequences starting to show for people from all walks of life. The particular effect it has on planes, though, is that it's notably increasing the amount of turbulence that's experienced. According to the Federal Aviation Administration, turbulence is a random motion of air that can be created by atmospheric pressure, jet streams, air around mountains, cold or warm weather fronts, or thunderstorms. Luckily, these effects can usually be predicted by onboard equipment that measures weather patterns, or visually by pilots who can see disturbances ahead. Climate change, however, is increasing the incidences of clear air turbulence, which is a form of turbulence that can't be seen or detected because, as the name suggests, the sky appears to be totally clear. This type of turbulence is caused by activity within the atmospheric jet streams, which are corridors of strong winds that move weather around the planet. Global warming has been found to make these jet streams even stronger, therefore increasing their effect on all weather systems, including the chances of creating this clear air turbulence. As climate change continues, it is likely the cost of flying will increase, with larger volumes of fuel needed to combat the ever stronger winds, and it could soon become a far less comfortable means of transport if planes are constantly bumping around. Number 4. The food is always bad it's one of the biggest grievances of travelers worldwide, but it turns out there's a good reason why food tastes awful on planes, and there's very little the airlines can do about it. We've all been there, having to make a choice between meals that you know won't make much of a difference, because either way you'll get a hastily warmed plate of what barely looks like food. But even if you were able to have a five-star meal delivered to you, it wouldn't taste that great. Of course, the cabin crews are somewhat limited with what they can serve in the first place. There are no standard ovens on board, nor is it safe or feasible to freshly prepare everything, so most meals are prepackaged and simply heated up with hot air before being served to you. The main reason the eating experience on a flight is so horrible, though, comes down to how our senses are affected on board in a way that actually changes how we perceive taste. The air circulated on board, first of all, affects your sense of smell. Then your sense of taste is affected by the lowering pressure and humidity levels. 
In fact, according to a study in 2010 that was commissioned by the German airline Lufthansa, low pressure and dryness can reduce the sensitivity of your taste buds to sweet and salty foods by around 30%. They found that sour, bitter, and spicy flavors are unaffected, though. And this leads to another reason plain food tastes awful – the recipes. With your taste having been compromised, chefs try to stimulate your sense of smell, which is just as important for the enjoyment of food. To do this, they salt and spice the food far more than any normal restaurant would. The final effect that researchers have now begun to suggest affects flavors in planes is the sound of the engines. In flight, there's a constant background noise of around 85 decibels, and this has been proven to reduce salty and sweet tastes, which makes dining even less enjoyable. Even if airlines spend far more time and resources into developing their in-flight meals, they simply will never be able to complete with the dining experience at ground level. The best advice to anyone would be to get yourself a great meal in the airport before boarding your flight, and never fully rely on the meals you're served on board a plane. Number 3. Flying is unhygienic as if there weren't enough things to be aware of when you're flying, but studies have shown that planes are not exactly the most hygienic of places. With quick turnarounds being needed to keep airlines profitable, there's simply not enough time to fully clean the plane between flights. And with the behaviors of some passengers, this means that planes are often teeming with bacteria. It all starts when you're going through security at the airport. Thousands of people are screened each day, and part of the process involves putting your possessions in those plastic tubs as they go through the x-ray machine. The real problem here is that these tubs are very rarely cleaned, with one study suggesting they are bacteria traps that harbor enough harmful bacteria to make someone ill. Once you get past this stage, then the actual cleanliness of the plane leaves a lot to be desired too. Passengers are often known to have to change babies' diapers on their tray tables, clip their nails, trample all sorts of dirt and debris into the carpet in the aisles, and don't even think about the state of the floors in the lavatories. The reusable items you're given for your flight, such as blankets and headphones, are also rarely cleaned, with it thought that passengers can be up to a hundred times more likely to catch a cold whilst on a plane compared to anywhere else. The recycled air in the cabin only helps to magnify this problem. Water is also potentially dangerous on board because it's stored in hard-to-clean tanks, which can prove to be a great breeding spot for coliform bacteria. Free coffee and tea can pass these on to the passengers, and you absolutely mustn't ever drink from the taps in the bathroom. The simple solution to all this is to clean the space yourself. Hand sanitizers and wipes are a good idea, and you definitely should never walk around a plane barefooted, and only drink drinks that have come from sealed bottles. Number 2. The Plug Doors Every part of an aircraft is meticulously designed for safety and reliability, with every hole in the fuselage being a potential weak point. Of these vulnerabilities, the doors are the most obvious, but they're built in a way that ensures that they're arguably more resilient than the rest of the plane. Known as plug doors, they are used in pressurized cabins of commercial airliners and are unusual in their operation and design compared to conventional hinge doors. The main feature of a plug door is its ability to seal itself against the doorframe using the interior cabin pressure. When an aircraft rises, the cabin pressure increases, pressing the door more firmly against its frame and enhancing the seal. This mechanism ensures a high level of safety as it effectively prevents the door from being opened accidentally or purposefully during flight. Conversely, at lower altitudes or on the ground when the cabin pressure is equalized with the external pressure, the doors can be opened without requiring excessive force. Plug doors are designed to be larger than the opening they cover. This is crucial for creating an effective seal and as the door is closed, it's slightly cammed inward and then locked into place, forming a secure barrier against the pressure difference. This is a key factor in maintaining the structural integrity of the aircraft's cabin, especially at cruising altitudes where the pressure differential between the inside and outside of the aircraft is at its maximum. The construction of these plug doors involves advanced materials and engineering. High-strength, lightweight materials such as aluminum alloys, composite materials, and sometimes titanium are used to construct them to make sure they're strong enough to withstand the pressure. The locking mechanisms are equally sophisticated, often involving multiple latches or bolts that secure the door in place, controlled by both manual and automatic systems. In case of emergencies, the doors are equipped with an automatic decompression mechanism that equalizes the pressure, allowing for quick and safe opening, a feature that is critical during an emergency evacuation where quickly leaving the aircraft is necessary. 
They are therefore designed to be fail-safe in any eventualities, incorporating multiple redundancies in their locking and sealing mechanisms to ensure they function properly in whatever way is needed. Number 1. Controlled Sleeping while they may have a cabin above the cockpit to take a rest, the pilots are generally needed through the entire flight. But with fatigue being one of the biggest risks to everyone on board, there's another way by which the flight crew can ensure they're alert when needed. It often surprises people to know that during some stages of a long-haul flight, one of the pilots may actually be asleep at the controls. But this is all part of a process that keeps them at peak efficiency. Known as controlled rest, this practice allows pilots to take short, planned naps under controlled conditions in order to combat fatigue and manage it effectively in order to maintain a high safety standard. Sleep deprivation and circadian rhythm disruptions, which are common in long-haul flights across multiple time zones, can severely impair a pilot's cognitive functions, decision-making abilities, and reaction times. Pilot controlled sleeping is implemented as a countermeasure to these risks, allowing pilots to maintain optimal performance levels. Controlled rest is carefully regulated by airline policies and aviation authorities. These guidelines specify the duration, timing, and conditions under which controlled rest can be taken. Typically, a controlled nap is limited to around 40 minutes, and a duration selected to prevent pilots from entering deep sleep phases, which can lead to sleep inertia. And the timing of the rest period is also critical. It's usually scheduled during the cruise phase of the flight, which is the least demanding part of the journey, and well before the descent and landing phases, so that there's plenty of time for pilots to fully regain alertness. During a controlled rest period, one pilot takes over the full responsibility of flying the aircraft while the other one rests. The resting pilot usually reclines in their seat and is not disturbed unless there's an emergency or a critical situation. The cockpit environment is adjusted to facilitate rests such as dimming lights and minimizing unnecessary noise. And before starting the rest period, both pilots agree on the duration and wake-up protocol. The waking pilot then undergoes a reorientation process to ensure full alertness before resuming active duty. It's a tool that's been backed by science, but controlled rest is not a substitute for proper pre-flight rest and scheduling to manage fatigue. Airlines and regulatory bodies emphasize the importance of comprehensive risk management systems that take all of these into account so the pilots are as sharp and as alert as possible at all times when in control of an aircraft. Thanks for watching guys, I'll see you next time. Thank you to our channel members.